we are nearing the end of this exciting epic of the rise and fall of the kings of Israel and Judah. Um, the, as I've said each week, the, the sweeping story of the dynasty, the kingdom of Israel and Judah and their kings is told in the books of history in the Old Testament. And we, we read there about all sorts of conflict and conspiracy and carnage and carnality as one flawed king after another occupies the throne. Last Sunday, we examined the story of one of Judah's greatest kings, King Hezekiah. And Hezekiah was fully devoted to the Lord. He trusted in God and obeyed all of his commandments. In fact, when the king was desperate and dying, he still remained devoted to God. However, he did make one very dumb mistake toward the end of his reign. When a, a diplomatic envoy from the distant kingdom of Babylon uh, arrived in Jerusalem, King Hezekiah gave them a tour of his kingdom, including the temple and his royal palace and the royal treasuries. There was nothing in the kingdom that he didn't show them. And the Babylonians took notice of all the gold and the silver and the spices and all the other treasures of Jerusalem, and they decided to come back later. Not as friends, but as foes. And although Hezekiah was a good and godly king, his son Manasseh, who inherited the throne, grew to become the most malevolent and malicious king to rule Judah. And the Bible doesn't tell us why Manasseh fell so far from the tree, but it says in 2 Kings 21, he did what was evil in the Lord's sight, following the detestable practices of the pagan nations. King Manasseh rebuilt the pagan altars that his father Hezekiah had tore, tore down. He constructed altars for Baal and set up Asherah poles. He worshipped the sun, moon, and stars as gods. He, he built a, a pagan altar in the temple of Yahweh, inside the Lord's temple. He built a pagan altar. He sacrificed his own son to Molech by burning him alive, just as King Ahaz had done a couple generations earlier. He practiced sorcery and divination and consulted with mediums and psychics. Manasseh also murdered so many innocent people that the Bible says in, in chapter 21, verse 16, Jerusalem was filled from one end to the other with innocent blood. And during this large-scale massacre, uh, King Manasseh slaughtered many of the Lord's prophets, including the great prophet Isaiah. According to Jewish tradition, Isaiah was hiding from King Manasseh in a hollowed out tree. And Manasseh ordered that the tree be chopped down with Isaiah inside. He was sawn in two alive. Manasseh's son and successor Ammon was just as bad, following in the footsteps of his father for 22 years. Combined, these two kings reigned for 77 years, and King Manasseh and his son led Judah into the deepest depths of depravity in their history. And so in light of all that these kings had done, God determined in chapter 21, verse 12 and following, I will bring such disaster on Jerusalem and Judah that the ears of those who hear about it will tingle with horror. I will judge Jerusalem by the same standard I used for Samaria and the same measure I used for the family of Ahab. I will wipe away the people of Jerusalem. God's plan to wipe out the kingdom of Judah was already in motion, but their impending doom was postponed when King Ammon's own officials conspired to assassinate him. And Ammon's death opened the door for the second youngest king in Hebrew history to take the throne, King Josiah. Ammon's son Josiah was only eight years old when his father was assassinated, making him, like I said, the second youngest to, to rule the kingdom. The only king younger than him was King Joash, who claimed the throne at age seven. Age seven, he became king just a few generations earlier. But of the two fledgling kings, Josiah was by far more suited to the throne. And Josiah's story begins in 2 Kings chapter 23. If you'd like to, to follow along, you can open up your Bibles there. And we immediately discover there in 2 Kings chapter 23 that King Josiah 
was a far better king than his father or his grandfather. Um, his mother, whose name was Jedidah, and means God's darling, must have taught little Josiah about the Lord because the Bible tells us in chapter 22, verse 2, he did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight and followed the example of his ancestor David. He did not turn away from doing what was right. And as we survey the, the reign of King Josiah, we discover three great achievements, great accomplishments that he achieved. First, he led the people in rediscovering the word. In the 18th year of his reign, King Josiah began a renovation project to make repairs to the Lord's temple, which had been desecrated during Manasseh's reign. And during this renovation project, the high priest Hilkiah found in a dark, dusty corner of the temple a set of scrolls. After brushing them off and unrolling the scroll, he realized what he had in his hands, and he immediately turned and shouted, I have found the book of the law in the Lord's temple. He reported this to the court secretary, and you have to understand the situation. Because of these ungodly kings like Manasseh and Ammon and others, no one had read or even seen a copy of God's word in nearly a hundred years. Can you even imagine that? A hundred years without reading or hearing the word of God. King Josiah believed in the Lord, but all he knew of God came from the stories that his mom told him and passed on from generations earlier. He'd never actually read scripture for himself. No one had. And so after Hilkiah discovered the scrolls and reported them to the court secretary, the, the secretary then took the scrolls and he rushed them to the king. And the court secretary unrolled the scrolls and began reading them aloud to King, Hezekiah, or king Josiah for the first time. And when Josiah heard what was written in God's word, he, he tore his clothes in despair. King Josiah immediately recognized that the people had not been living their lives according to the word of God. He, he was shocked at just how far astray the kingdom of Judah had wandered, and it broke his heart. And so right away, the Bible says in 2 Kings uh, chapter 22 again, Then the king summoned all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem, and the king went up to the temple of the Lord with all the people of Judah and Jerusalem, all of the priests and the prophets, all the people from the least to the greatest. And there the king read to them the entire book of the covenant that had been found in the Lord's temple. The entire book of the covenant, by the way, he's talking about the Pentateuch, what we call the Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Five, the first five books of the Bible, he stood up and he read the entire thing to this massive audience of people who had never heard it before. And then right then and there, King Josiah publicly pledged to obey the Lord by keeping all of his commands and laws and decrees with all his heart and soul. Rediscovering the word of God was life-changing for Josiah, and, and he immediately wanted to share it with everybody. Maybe it's time that you and I rediscover God's word too. You know, you and I live in a very privileged period of history. You know, unlike King Josiah and everybody else who lived before the, the printing press was invented, we have the Bible readily available to us all the time. I mean, you've probably got several of them on your bookshelves at home, right? Probably one for everybody in the family or something like that, at least a couple. I've got 13 different Bibles on my shelf in my office. That's not counting the ones we've got at home, but just in my office, I have 13. I've got five different English translations, two foreign language translations. I've got study Bibles, devotional Bibles. I've even got comic book Bibles. And, and now, thanks to modern technology, everybody, you know, I'm looking around the room and you guys are sitting there with your phone. Phones, right? I mean, we've got God's Word available in hundreds, thousands of translations at our fingertips anytime that we want it. But like I've said before, just because we have easy access to God's Word doesn't mean we actually read it. You know, based on a survey conducted by the Barna Research Institute, George Barna concluded Americans revere the Bible, 
but by and large, they don't know what it says. We're not altogether different from the kingdom of Judah after all. But listen, rather than beat you up about not reading the Bible more, which I think we tend to do to ourselves, I want to challenge you to do something about it. So if you have the, the YouVersion Bible app on your phone, which I think most people probably do, pick out a Bible reading plan and then send me a friend request and invite me to join you in your reading plan. And I'll accept that and we'll read that together. Just do something short, maybe a couple of weeks long. I don't need everybody sending me a 365-day reading plan. I'm going to get, you know, and if I get like 50 different invitations, I can't promise I'll keep up with all of them and finish on time. But I'll do my best to read along with whatever you're reading, and then we'll get into and rediscover God's Word together. Of course, rediscovering the Word was just the beginning of King Josiah's accomplishments. Furthermore, King Josiah led the people of Judah in repenting of their wickedness. It's never enough just to read God's word if we don't do what it says, right? Well, Josiah understood that instinctively. So after reading the book of the law, Josiah initiated this sweeping reforms, religious reforms, on a larger scale than any other king had ever done in the past. More than... Hezekiah more than Jehoshaphat. He changed everything, and he did it by getting rid of everything that led them astray. First, he, he cleansed the temple of the Lord, removing all of the articles and altars that were used in Baal worship. He burned all of those artifacts in the Kidron Valley. He just burned them to ashes. And then he took the ashes and he shipped them as far away as Bethel because he didn't even want the remains of these sacrilegious items in the kingdom of Jerusalem. And so he, he tore down these Asherah poles. He banished all of the, the pagan and idolatrous priests. He, he burned everything else that he could find that was related to pagan worship. He destroyed all the shrines throughout the city of Jerusalem and all of Judea. He even traveled to the old capital city, Samaria, of the northern kingdom. That had already been destroyed. There was no one even living there except for pagans. And he destroyed their pagan altars too. He desecrated the altars built by Manasseh and Jeroboam and others. The Bible says that he just smashed them to bits. One altar in particular held special significance. The Bible says in chapter 23, verse 10, Then the king defiled the altar of Topheth in the valley of Ben-Hinnom, so no one could ever again use it to sacrifice a son or daughter in the fire as an offering to Molech. This is the altar upon which King Manasseh and King Ahaz and others sacrificed their firstborn sons. The one I talked about before is the bronze altar with the open hands and the, the furnace underneath, and they would lay the baby on the hands and just watch it writhe in pain as it burned alive. It was located in this valley, Ben-Hinnom, on the south side of Jerusalem, outside of the walls of the city. They built it there so that the screams of the babies that were being burned alive wouldn't disturb the people within the walls. The horrifying sins committed in this valley would have far-reaching consequences. And just as a side note, this event was extremely important, not just as an act of repentance on the part of King Josiah and, and the rest of the kingdom, but it would affect Jesus' teachings when he comes and teaches in Jerusalem. He refers to this valley many times throughout his teaching and the things that went on there. I won't get into it now because it strays too far from our main topic here, but look for me to, to post an explanation of the significance of Ben-Hinnom uh, online later this week if you're interested in reading what this valley was and what it meant to the teachings of Jesus. Josiah, for now, did the right thing by demolishing the altar to Molech and, and executing the pagan priests who performed these, these sickening sacrifices. The Bible adds that too in chapter 23, verse 24, Josiah also got rid of the mediums and psychics, the household gods. Like he went, in, he went to people's houses and said, if you've got idols in your house, give them up. We're melting them down and burning them. The idols and every other kind of detestable practice, both in Jerusalem and throughout the land of Judah. King Josiah led his people in repentance by destroying the elements and emblems that they used to sin against God. And I wonder if you and I don't have some altars and idols that we need to tear down as well. 
you know, false gods come in, in many different forms. Money, power, fame, possessions, sex, drugs, whiskey, success, even the God of self. Anything that takes God's rightful place in our hearts and lives can become an idol of our own making. And sometimes repentance is as simple as a heartfelt apology and a prayer. But other times, repentance requires more drastic, dramatic measures. You know, whatever stumbling blocks or temptations have been causing you to sin again and again, those things that just repeatedly cause problems for you in your life, it's time to tear those altars and idols down. You know, we need to manifest the, the heart of Josiah as we search our own hearts and lives for wickedness and repent of it. And finally, in addition to rediscovering the word and repenting of their wickedness, King Josiah also led the people in restoring their worship. Restoring their worship. After ridding the entire kingdom of paganism and idolatry, King Josiah set out to restore the worship of the one true God of Judah. And the Bible says that King Josiah issued this order to all the people. He says in verse 21, You must celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God as required in this book of the covenant. Now, the Passover was an important Hebrew celebration commemorating the day that God had led the people out of Egypt, and out of slavery in Egypt. And this special holy day had been neglected and forgotten for about as long as, as God's word had been neglected and forgotten. So for generations, as much as a hundred years had gone by without them celebrating what God had done for them in their history. And of course... Josiah wasn't content simply, you know, throwing together a small celebration in God's honor. This was no intimate get-together. Rather, King Josiah went all out. And the Bible says in verse 22 and following, there had not been a Passover celebration like that since the time when the judges ruled in Israel, nor throughout all of the years of the kings of Israel and Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah's reign, this Passover was celebrated to the Lord in Jerusalem. You know, one of the reasons that we meet together every week, every Sunday morning, is to give you the opportunity to celebrate the Lord, to celebrate all that God is and all that He's done for you in your life. And one of the things that we, we do in order to celebrate God is, is communion. The Lord's Supper and communion is very much a continuation of Passover. You know, the bread and the grape juice don't remind us of God leading us out of slavery in Egypt but they do remind us of God leading us out of slavery to sin, thanks to the cross of Christ. And every time we take communion or sing a song or say a prayer, we ought to be celebrating the glory and the greatness of God. Josiah and the people of Judah weren't worshiping a, a terrifying, unpredictable force that would destroy them on a whim. Rather, they celebrated a faithful, personal God of grace who loved them and rescued them time and again. And the same is true for us. You know, the Bible says in Psalm 100, verse 1 and 2, Shout with joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him singing with joy. Let's follow Josiah's example and celebrate the Lord like never before. You know, when all was said and done, King Josiah was one of, if not the greatest king ever to sit on the throne of Judah and Jerusalem. The Bible sums up his story saying in chapter 23, verse 25, Never before had there been a king like Josiah who turned to the Lord with all his heart and soul and strength, obeying all the laws of Moses, and there has never been a king like him since. By rediscovering the word, repenting of their wickedness, and restoring their worship of the one true God, King Josiah set himself apart from all of his predecessors. And these three things, they remain the essential steps in reestablishing our own relationship with God. Anytime we go astray in life, these are the things we need to do. Repent of our sins and, and return to God's word and, and start worshiping him with all of our hearts. These are the things that God has given us to do to rebuild and reestablish our own relationships with Him. It's just too bad that Israel and Judah didn't have more kings like Josiah. Sadly, despite all of his efforts, 
King Josiah couldn't turn the hearts of the people back to God for good. Because of Josiah's faithfulness, God postponed the destruction of Jerusalem for a generation. But when Josiah died in battle against the Egyptians, the, Lord, or the people appointed his son Jehoahaz as the next king. And like so many of the kings before him, Jehoahaz did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He sat on the throne for 23 years as little more than a, a puppet for the Egyptians. And, and then Pharaoh threw King Jehoahaz in prison and appointed his brother, Josiah's other son, Eliakim, as the new king of Judah. But Eliakim also did what was evil in the Lord's sight. And during his reign, a new world power arose. Under the leadership of King Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian Empire overthrew the Assyrians, conquered the Egyptians, and then invaded the kingdom of Judah. But when they, they brought Judah under their control, forced them to be sort of like indentured servants that paid a tribute to the Babylonian Empire. But after a while, Judah rebelled. They didn't want to pay tribute anymore. And so King Nebuchadnezzar led his entire army against J Judah to punish the kingdom and its king. The Babylonians surrounded Jerusalem, laid siege to its walls. For two long years, they surrounded the city and everybody just holed up inside. The king of Judah and what remained of his forces tried to flee through a, a crack, a break in the wall, but they were apprehended on the other side. And as punishment, Nebuchadnezzar executed the king's sons in front of him and then gouged out his eyes so that the last thing he ever saw was the death of his sons. Afterward, King Nebuchadnezzar burned down the temple of the Lord, the royal palace, and all of the houses within Jerusalem. They utterly destroyed the entire kingdom, and the surviving Jews were carted away as exiles to Babylon, where they became servants and slaves for the next 70 years. It would be a tragic ending to the epic story of Judah's kings and kingdom, except it's not the end. After 70 years of exile and captivity, the people of Judah were set free. Many of them returned and began rebuilding the city of Jerusalem in hopes of one day becoming a kingdom once more. The prophets spoke of a coming king who would restore all things, a king who would reign forever and ever, a king who would sit upon the very throne of God. Next week, we'll conclude our series on the kings of Israel and Judah with the arrival of the king of kings. In the meantime, wherever you are, I want to invite you to follow Josiah's example. And maybe it's time for you to rediscover God's word and start digging into the Bible and, and just see how that changes and impacts your life. Maybe you need to repent of some wickedness in your own heart and life or tear down some altars that are keeping you from worshiping God the way you should. And if I can help in any way, I want to invite you to come and talk with me after church. But for right now, I want to stand and celebrate the Lord together as we worship and sing His praises. Let's stand and sing together, church.